Hey everyone, welcome to the Flophouse Mini. We've got a treat for you today. First, we'll all introduce our regular selves, and then I'll introduce our guests. I'm Dan McCoy. Hey, I'm Stuart Wellington. I'm Elliot Kalen, but I'm not my regular self, Dan, because I was bitten by a radioactive spider earlier in the day, and mm-hmm. I think my bones are weak as a result, so I'm less <laughs> than regular. Uh-huh. Okay. Uh, and with us, um, we have two uh, great comedy legend comedy writer guests we've got mike reese of uh the simpsons uh four-time any emmy winner and ken keeler of the simpsons also futurama uh mike asked ken how many emmys he had it turns out he has one more than mike so for those keeping score right now it is mike four ken five the night um, is young. I still like yeah, you. Know what? That's right. <laughs> and I'm not working. So. <laughs> you never know. <laughs> like Elliot has a few lying around. He might just motor over, give you one, Mike. Yeah. <laughs> just I mean, to even the score. It's possible. I'm, I mean, it's it, you'd have to scratch out my name, but I think that might be worth it just to make this game competitive again. Yeah, exactly. There's the terrible joke I made. I gave one of my Emmys to my mom because I. I didn't have a birthday present for her. <laughs> and and I, I planned the moment she dies, I want to go to her house and grab the Emmy bag. And it will be like winning the Emmy for best orphan. <laughs> oh. oh, God. Well, you know, Corona. Yeah. Who knows? You could get lucky. Yeah, you're right, Dan. Good. Yeah. That's the right way to take that one. It's just. Sure, yeah. <laughs> Give, a, give Mike some like hope to, about that. Yeah, I needed, I'd like to say, I needed this is the of first time for my mom. So thanks. <laughs> we tweeted at each other briefly, but this is the first time I'm seeing Mike face to face, and within minutes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we. Dan usually waits until at least the second appearance to wish death upon the mother of a guest. <laughs> I'm sitting uh, thinking how many Emmys well, I can give my mom. Well, it's a very. <laughs> <laughs> Well, one more than Mike. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it's a very special thing that brings us all together uh-huh. uh, today. This 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 episode will be released on um, Halloween itself, and of course, there's one Halloween song that towers above the rest. Thriller. Uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> well, that is the that is the only one that comes close. But we're talking, of course, of the Monster Mash. And uh, I tweeted about the Monster Mash recently, as I want to do every year around this time, and sometimes not at this time mm-hmm. uh, of the year. And uh, Mike somehow saw this and uh, talked about how much he can love the Monster Mash. Yeah, was it? It was and probably sh- one of those content aggregator sites that was putting together the world's <laughs> worst tweets. <laughs> yep. <laughs> uh, he might he might have had a Google alert set for writers who are supposed to be working right now. <laughs> uh, well, anyway, this uh, long story short, we're here to talk about the Monster Mash, of course, by Bobby Boris Pickett, who I uh, I wanted to say I, I I was looking into this. You might be surprised; it is hard to find a complete discography of all of Bobby Boris Pickett's songs online. Mm. Um, but he did chase after this particular rainbow many other times <laughs> in his career. He also wrote Monsters Holiday, Monster Motion, Transylvania Twist, Blood Bank Blues, Me and My Mummy, The Monster Swim, and The Monster Rap. And I think that there are more that I was not able to track down. So he uh, well, it's hard to know because, and then... as everyone knows, uh, he first came to the public attention when Alan Lomax was walking through the, the bayous of Louisiana with his tape recorder <laughs> and found Bobby Boris Pickett singing what uh, he assumed at first was an old spiritual about uh, the creation of a, a brought back to life corpse, uh, and it rocketed him to superstardom. So who knows what he recorded on you know wax cylinders or things like that before that in the small recording studios of the South? Uh, hard to say. And do you have the album? Do you have the the uh, the Bobby Boris Pickett album? Do I? No. Absolutely yes. not. No. Okay. <laughs> I don't even like the Monster Mash. <laughs> I have to give. I, I want to get, jump in and just give some history on this, which was in 1981, I think. 
Ken Keeler was working on a Newsweek parody, and the Harvard Lampoon was doing, and he wrote this article <laughs> reporting the, the sort of the lyrics of the Monster Mash <laughs> as if it was a breaking news story. <laughs> and it was, I mean, everybody loved this article, and it still reads great, but I, I think what was so special about it was the idea that it was the sudden realization everybody knows this song every single person not only know that's heard it but it's pretty familiar with all the lyrics and the turns it takes so i thought that was the great observation and uh that's why i insisted ken be I, here i have scratched my head trying to remember what prompted it i mean it was the middle of summer i couldn't have been hearing it on the radio but I mean, it was one of those things where whatever it was, it, it came to me in a flash, as they say, the way things catch on. And uh, I, it just, it wrote itself, as I, I always say, it took about five minutes and I suppose you could make it better, but it wouldn't really change the essence of it. It's just, that's the monster mash. This thing, these things happened. And okay. But it's, well, it's true, I... like the monster mash has entered kind of like folklore status the same way that like i have a six and a half year old son and the other day he goes daddy daddy have you heard this song about jingle bells batman smells and i was like yeah i've heard it how did you hear it like it was the monster mash is like that like it's just it's just lore now it just it, i don't it just free floats around and everybody knows it i don't know yeah, has, there's has, always been a mash yes yeah, has, <laughs> has your son been hanging out on like uh like old railroad tracks and with hobos and such <laughs> yeah, yeah. it was him and alan lomax just wandering the bayous yeah. looking for Okay, for traditional American folk Lomax nursery come rhymes. Does come you know? up on this well, podcast I mean, a lot? <laughs> <laughs> no, I've been looking for an opportunity for years. For years. He'll be joining I mean, us I think... on Zoom. Uh, very... <laughs> <laughs> I do feel like there's a, a an arc I went through with the Monster Mash where I was like, I was a kid who, you know, enjoyed it because it was a song about monsters that would play on <laughs> Halloween. And then I grew older, and I'm like, oh, fuck this song. This song's a novelty tune. Like, it's just, like, this nonsense song that was, like, a cash-in. And then as I've grown it's older... It's like he doesn't like... even care about the monsters. <laughs> <laughs> but as I've been older, like, I don't know whether it's Stockholm Syndrome or what, but, like, what is cheap and about the Monster Mash is what I has come to love it. Like, the more nakedly it is, this attempt to just do a novelty hit, the more I love it, you know, and well, I mean, although it did come about kind of organically, like he, he like it's my understanding that he just started to do a Boris Karloff impression with his band on stage one night and people loved it. So he's like, I guess this is what I do now. <laughs> but there's what you're talking about, Dan, is the arc I go through every time I listen to the song. It first yeah. starts and I'm like, oh, here it comes, the Monster Mash. This is going to be fun. And then about two verses in, I'm like, what the fuck is this? <laughs> like, it's so, like, it's such a dumb song and it's so totally not in keeping with the spirit of the Universal Monsters. And then by the end of it, I'm like, i got to admire it. He wrote a whole song about this uh, monsters doing a dance. Like, and like, it that's is achievement. long. I, it's a I long played song. it on the guitar the other day and like, <laughs> what? <laughs> by, by, by the Shut time you Dan, up, Dan I feel like Dan, you, Dan, you are a parody of yourself in quarantine that you were playing Monster Mash on guitar in your apartment. Well, Audrey it really likes to sing. We can't go to karaoke, obviously, because like that would murder everyone right now so we were i was just playing guitar we were singing songs and i was like i gotta sing the monster mash and i get to like i get done with verse three and i'm like surely this song is over and then there's a lot more to the song i have to take exception to this i, I never thought it was stupid i mean i never thought it was brilliant yeah. but i thought yeah when they when bobby boris pickett wrote it he sort of knew what it was that was appealing about it i don't feel like yeah. people are when, when people for example like your tweets i don't to me I, those don't read as making fun of it it's yeah that if you if you showed them to bobby mm -hmm. boris piggy said yeah that's about right i'm gonna go well, no, deeper I... which is because i've been because i have nothing else to do i've been <laughs> thinking about the monster mash for about a month knowing we'd be doing a 15 minute podcast <laughs> And I'm not being facetious when I say, I think it may be the greatest song in the history of songs. <laughs> and, and part of that is, like, I'm old enough. We had the single when it came out. I was three, but we had it playing in the house. And I've never gotten tired of it. And we have, we, every Halloween, we break out this dancing Frankenstein that plays the monster <laughs> man. 
<laughs> and I still, I enjoy the song every single time. And I can't listen to the Beatles anymore. 200 plus songs. I'm sick of every one of them. Monster Mash still does it for me. <laughs> Well, when I say it's stupid, I say it with great affection because some of my favorite things are very, very stupid. (laughs) But I love that. I mean, it tells a whole whole story. But um, I I don't know. uh, This may be controversial, but I don't think the story holds together. (laughs) I I will say it's more coherent than the later Universal Monster movies where they're just throwing all the monsters into a house together to see what happens. (laughs) You know, like it's at least it tells a better story than that. But uh. Here's the here's the main issue I have with it, and this is going to sound possibly pedantic, is that he's doing a Boris Karloff impression for Dr. Frankenstein, essentially. Boris Karloff mm. often played Dr. Frankenstein. He should be doing a um, Colin Clive impression. Well, there you have it, Boris Pickett. I threw down the gauntlet. What do you say to that? <laughs> you got him. I, I mean- got him. Boom. <laughs> Consider this myth busted. <laughs> <laughs> One thing I noticed, too, about the story of the song is, and this is why I think it's so rich, is you don't expect it. It's actually Dracula's story. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he, has the, he has the change of heart in it. Yeah, he's the one who, who, who learns something. It's, it's sort of like the last version of A Star is Born. He had his Transylvania twist, <laughs> mm-hmm. supplanted by the Monster Mash. He's bitter. But it has a happy ending. Now he's playing with the band. That is the arc of the song. <laughs> well, I like that the narrator reassures you too. Like in case you were worried that Dracula <laughs> bears a grudge, he says, "Now everything's cool. Drac's a part of the band." And you're like, that, "Okay, good." The minor conflict that arose. Well, is that, that that pinpoints something I love about Halloween and the way these monsters have become such an accepted part of like culture and kid culture Mm -hmm. is he's literally talking about there's a specific bedroom where vampires eat people and there's all these ghouls but the problem of it is dracula's not happy about this song don't worry (laughs) they made up like the fact that they're all gonna leave and murder people is not an issue it's totally okay well also i mean like do these do these monsters i guess the universal horror movies have proven that these monsters do just hang out together Mm -hmm. But I mean, I don't know if it's like it hang out together. That, they, like, they run into each other sometimes. They're in the same business. Yeah, they meet each other, yeah. as the titles say. But like the Monster Mash things. is this clarion call. Like As soon as the Monster Mash starts happening, which immediately they know to call it a mash for some reason. I don't know what that is. But they come swooping in. <laughs> like, oh, a party's <laughs> happening. A monster party specifically, even though for you, the living, this mash is meant to. Is, is I it, love that. Something I out about that. Is a mash like a style yes, of dancing? Yes, the mash is... Remember the mashed potato? You. No, you wouldn't remember the mashed potato. There were yes. a series of mashed potato well, dances, I mean, and the monster with... mash was another mash in that style. In the same way that the Swiss Family Robinson—they're not mm. named Robinson. It's because another—it's another novel in the style of Robinson Crusoe. Uh, the mash is a genre, oh. as as we can oh. tell by how many other mashes there have been. <laughs> there's, there's, well, there's the show mash. There's the movie mash. Mm-hmm. All part of the same lineage, yep. I guess. After mash, you know that makes that makes the monster swim make a lot more sense to me because suddenly, yeah. I'm like, oh yeah, the swim is a type of dance. Whereas, having never heard the monster swim, I'm just like imagining, you know, you go to a, a, a public pool and they're like, okay, kids out of the pool, it's monster swim time. Mm-hmm. You know, like that was what. And yeah, the, and then the gill man gets yeah. in. Sure. And then all the kids yeah. wait around the edge of the pool laps. and they're all mad that they can't swim. <laughs> <laughs> they're mad that they're mad that the bride is swimming super slowly, just really mm-hmm. rubbing it in that she gets the pool all to herself. Yeah. I do, uh, Dan. You mentioned uh, that it mentions how this song is for you, the living, as well. I like that because it's like a little touch of Abraham Lincoln yes. gets into the song. Mm-hmm. You and know? yes, I had too. just noticed that as I've been <laughs> thinking about it over the past couple of weeks. It's I, and you, they, they made me look at all the lyrics. It's pretty elegantly written. I mean, that dialogue is. It's mm-hmm. the rhyme scheme yep. is perfect. There's no forced or fake rhymes in the whole thing. Uh, well, I, <laughs> I will object only to, uh, only to highlight what is actually my favorite part of the song, because I believe it to be the most awkward part of the song, which is, I guess, I it. guess it's the bridge because it is different <laughs> from everything else in the song. You would, you would, you would call it the bridge where it's the zombies were having fun. The party had just begun. 
The yeah. guests included oh, Wolfman, Dracula, and his son. And I love it because, <laughs> like, it does feel like in the middle of his song, he, like, gave up for a little bit before he got a second wind. <laughs> like, <laughs> like right in the middle of the song, he's just going to be like, uh, okay, well, who was on the guest list? I'll, I'll explain that. And then now... Back to the back to the rocking part of the song. Look, there's a lot of monsters. You can't have lyrics for all of them, you know? You just gotta, <laughs> yeah. at some point, just list names, you know? Somebody, the Metaluna yeah. Mutant was there. Uh, also, probably <laughs> King Kong. Uh, <laughs> maybe the characters from uh, The Black Cat, were they monsters? <laughs> Let's just continue with the song. See, there's a rhyme for you too, Dan. <laughs> yeah, great. Someone observe, uh, when we, part of why I love the song, you can just, keep unpacking it and someone mentioned that dracula wakes up from his coffin in the middle of the party and which makes you think she said so he came to the party with his coffin <laughs> and it, it makes you think oh fuck dracula's gonna stay all night long <laughs> the detail that i've been thinking about a lot is that the coffin bangers, or baggers, I'm not quite sure which, probably coffin baggers, were about to arrive with their vocal group, the Crypt Kicker 5. Now, the song is credited to Bobby <laughs> Boris Pickett and the Crypt Kickers. <laughs> what happened to the coffin baggers? How yeah. did they lose their credit? I mean, they're apparently the musicians, moreover, <laughs> yeah. because the Crypt Kickers are vocalists. <laughs> I don't know. Somebody got screwed out of some royalties. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's, it's Crypt Kickers. Right through the looking glass. <laughs> Crip kickers a pun on shit kickers. That just suddenly hit me. Because what is that otherwise? I can only assume. Yeah, I mean, it's gotta be. It's one of those. It's one of those jokes, like when they did the poster for the Smurfs movie, and they're like, "Smurf happens." Don't even bring it up. You're like, Don't even bring it up. That only makes sense because you know it means shit. <laughs> Not a fan of those. Not a fan of the kids' movie taglines that where you need to know swear words to understand them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I, there's a, I guess, uh, it's interesting, you, you rarely hear a song that documents the credits that the songwriters <laughs> then try to hide. Like, there's not there's not a lot of those. It seems like a bad strategy, yeah. It's like, hey, look, guess who you're listening to, but, uh, you know, it's a secret. Keep... <laughs> this is probably why he just had one hit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and this is something else I had to write to Ken about it because he is a mathematician, which was the Monster Mash is a dance, but it's also a song. They say the band was playing mm -hmm. the Monster Mash, but the song the Monster Mash is about the song the Monster Mash. It tells you the creation of the song and goes to the end to saying it's the hit of the land. So somehow the song knows <laughs> that the song will be a hit. And I thought it's, it's I found it more confusing than Tenet. I, just... <laughs> I mean, I, I can only assume that, yeah, we do. I, I think this has been observed before, but the uh, the Monster Mash song is not about, is does, we do not hear the song The Monster Mash within The Monster Mash. The wow. Monster Mash, as we know it in this universe, is a song about another song well, called the Monster Mash. Unless, unless it is this song, and they added on a lyric at the add on a new verse, like a celebratory mm -hmm. verse uh -huh. to kind of to to do, or a boastful verse. Yeah. I don't know, but you're right. It is. It does raise the question of whether there is another Monster Mash out there, and whether it may even now still be lurking in that castle, yeah. forcing people to rock out to this dance that, as far as I know, nobody knows how to do. Like a yeah. lot of those dance songs would explain how to do the dances, right? Uh -huh. Like. Or like later on, like the time warp song in Rock Air Picture, uh -huh. like it explains how you do the time warp. But I don't know how to. I mean, the Monster Mash is some kind of mashed potato dance, but I don't know what you do that makes it monstery. You know, it is my understanding that it is like the mashed potato, but you hold your arms out in a sort of a, a, a Frankenstein's monster, traditional stereotypical uh, motion. Dan, you you're, you're really doing. missing your calling as like a bar mitzvah like MC <laughs> character, like hype man who like gets everybody <laughs> on the dance floor to dance. And Dances. you explain the dances well, speaking, for people. I mean the monster the monster of... mash is not a huge bar mitzvah song. Really? Like that's uh, it's, I mean well, it was not I mean maybe it is a at Transylvanian bar mitzvahs. I don't know. I mean I don't know if you want to reveal this Elliot, but I mean we're talking about big life party events and I th there there's a very important connection that you personal connection you have to the monster Mash. well yeah sure well i danced the monster mash at my wedding yeah that goes oh, without yes. saying Let's... sure that's that's scientific fact that's the yeah. big 
twist ending to this podcast. It was not the, it was not the first dance song. No. What was that? The record of the Edmund uh, Fitzgerald? I did lobby for it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> there was a... It was, MacArthur's Park, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we danced to MacArthur Park. Uh, the... Uh, it was, well, I mean, originally our first dance was I Only Advise For You, not the Shabop Shabop version of it, uh-huh. closer to the version from the movie Dames. But uh, then the, I believe it was a uh, former coworker of mine, James Jimmy Don, who uh, requested that the Monster Mash be played by the DJ. And I was <laughs> delighted at that choice until two verses in where I was like, I'm still dancing to a song about monsters. <laughs> like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and then by the end of it, I was like, you know what? I like that I danced to a monster song at my wedding. So the uh, so I, again, I went through that whole that whole personal emotional roller coaster that comes with the Monster Mash. Uh, Dan, do you think we'll ever see a resurgence in monster novelty pop songs again? Oh, I hope so. You know, like I feel like the last the, the closest we got was when uh, unexpectedly. Like two bars of Werewolf Bar Mitzvah took the country by storm, and they're like, "We gotta put out a longer version of this." And so there's a fuller version of Werewolf Bar Mitzvah you can find. But do um, you think if Stuart if Universal's Dark Universe had gotten to make more movies, if they would have played like a soft, slow, acoustic version of the Monster Mash <laughs> over one of the trailers? <laughs> oh, it would be like Trent Reznor's version of the Monster Mash yeah, over, yeah, yeah. like, just like, you know, ambiguous shots of monsters. Well, because the song, if, I know, if I'm remembering correctly, it came out around the time that there was a resurgence in monster stuff because the Universal movies were being re-released to theaters and also packaged for television broadcast. So it was like, suddenly, monsters were big again. And so I wonder if maybe... Just maybe there's some beautiful day in the future when we can stop worrying about the world around us and start worrying again that someone's going to bring a dead body back to life and it's going to throw a girl in a lake or uh, like a Dracula is going to walk around and have both a daughter and a son. The daughter doesn't get mentioned in the song, but he has a movie where she he has one. Um, I don't know. Maybe that's too beautiful a world to hope for, but it's what I'm working towards with my new uh, act- political uh, activity pack group. Uh, it's wait, it's called. Wait, they're referring yeah. to Dracula's son. I thought they were referring to the Wolfman's son, and Dracula uh, was there too. Dracula and his y- son. But you think he identifies Wolfman? That's just insane. They always forget the everything madness. I was just saying. Stuart, we got to deal with this. We got to yeah. deal with this. Stuart, this what's that, the, what, what's what the possible? What's the lyric again? <laughs> the guests included Wolfman. Uh-huh. Dracula, Dracula and, and his, his son. son. So you I think, think it's went, modifying Wolfman. They went back to the front <laughs> okay, of the Okay, so here's another sentence. suggestion about how that might work. It's, it's so at some point, Dracula turned into a werewolf, and it's the list included Wolfman, parentheses, Dracula, and his son. <laughs> 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 it's possible. It's possible. Prove me wrong, Stuart. Uh, I mean, okay, I can't. Well, I don't have the lyric sheet in front of me. <laughs> much, <laughs> much like we release a damned soul by... Uh, driving a, ha- a stake through their heart. I feel like we need to release our guests from this horrible monster purgatory we've put them into uh, because I promised them <laughs> to not spend too much time talking about this stuff. But I want to thank... <laughs> you knew why make promises you can't keep, Dan? Well, that's, you're to... the fool with that one. The Shame podcast on is to... still not as long as the song itself. That's true, yeah. <laughs> Also, Mike and I are going to continue to talk about the Monster wanna... Mesh after this is over. So, <laughs> I mean, we can do it. I just <laughs> Here's my cheat sheet. I got so much more to talk about. Oh, do you have more? Oh, Look, yeah, tell us, tell I, us. I was worried. I'll just mention got that more, this might us. be a good wrap-up, but it's sort of a happy ending, which is... A friend of mine writes the comic strip Zits, and mm. I don't mean to brag, but he, he writes it, and <laughs> he, he made enough money off of Zits that he was able to buy a Malibu beach house on the beach, and the house on his left was owned by Paul Fusco, the man who operated and created the Alf Puppet. And the guy on his right was Bobby Boris Pickett. <laughs> so that has got to be the funnest block in Malibu. That's that's like what my my idea of as a child of what it would be like to be like a famous Hollywood entertainer would be, where it's like I'm gonna live next door to Alf. I'm gonna live next door to Bar- Bobby Boris Pickett. This is gonna be amazing. What did he say? Did he say what? Did, was he a good neighbor? 
did he tell you anything about them or he said they would party all night and they uh wow a bunch of monsters would come to the yeah. house <laughs> oh yeah it was autobiographical song to get it's a, autobiographical to get a jolt from his electrodes you get up, you get up at the, the, the doorbell rings at night and you get up and there's a mummy at the door and you're like, next door. Next. Not this house. Yeah. <laughs> He's really like Lou Reed. He just writes about the people he knows. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's, oh, now I want to see, now I want to see the movie about Bobby Boris Pickett where he's like, no one's writing songs about us, man. And he's sitting in a bar with like Frankenstein and Dracula. <laughs> Okay, well, I'm out. <laughs> thank, thank you so much for being with, with us, uh, Mike and Ken. I don't know if you, if you have anything to plug for whatever uh, uh, worth we have as a as a as a mouthpiece for that. Please do it. Um, we might be finally able to help them get the word out about the Simpsons. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Wolfman, Dracula, and no, his I son. I mean, with how a could... plug. <laughs> <laughs> I got nothing to plug. The son, right, by well, the way. The... One last thought: the son in the song comes off <laughs> like Eric Trump, where yeah. he just sort of he, he's got nothing to do. He comes to a party with his dad. Uh-huh. There's no other mention of him. He doesn't do anything. Does he have his own car? car? Drag, to clarify. Drag is like, I, I couldn't find a babysitter this late. <laughs> now, Dan, were you doing a Wolfman impression or a Dracula impression? Yeah, that was the, that was the Wolfman. Okay, well, uh, <laughs> on that note, to all of our listeners and to everyone in the world, Happy Halloween! (laughs) (laughs) Everyone's rolling their eyes and cut. MaximumFun.org Comedy and culture. Artist owned. Audience supported.